all the time we do things out of habit and not realize that there's deep spiritual meaning behind everything that we do. If it's instructions from God, we try to adhere to it to the best of our ability. We're not just people that go Easter egg hunting and go do other things on Resurrection Sunday. We come in to the house of God to honor God, to worship Him, to glorify Him because of all that He's done for us. We kind of know what God did for us in, to a degree. Uh, we have a little message and the title of this message today is Choose Jesus. Choose Jesus. I mean, it's a good thing for us to do. Choose Jesus. Amen. Uh, just bear with me and I believe the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us in areas that might illuminate us to the point where we can reach in deeper into what we have received on this Resurrection Sunday to bring it into our lives so that our lives will be more blessed, more prosperous, and more enhanced. I pray that everybody has ears to hear what the Spirit would speak to each one of us today and that we determine that we're not going to leave the same way that we came in. I pray that God would use this vessel of clay to articulate exactly what he wants to say. Not my will, but let his will be done today in Jesus' name. In the book of Matthew, chapter 27, verse 15 through verse 26 of the New King James Version, I'm going to read about the incident after Jesus was arrested. You know, he was arrested. People that go to jail think that, you know, they're special or they're different. But I'm here to tell you, man, that, that, that uh, sister, brother, my, our Lord and Savior was arrested too. Amen. And he turned out okay. Amen. In, 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 in verse 15, check this out. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing to the multitude one prisoner whom they wished. And at, this, at that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. You see, the, the, the governor of the feast was in a crux between two opinions, two decisions. He knew he had arrested an innocent person. And he knew there was a loophole that would allow the people to let this innocent person go if they chose to. Because he really didn't want to execute an innocent person, especially when his wife came to him and told him that she had been having some serious dreams about this guy and that he needed to back off because this was not an ordinary prisoner. But they say, it says they had an, another prisoner in jail with them, a not notorious man by the name of Barabbas. Verse 17 said, therefore, when they had gathered together, Pilate said to them, whom do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that they had handed him over because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent to him saying, have nothing to do with this just man, for I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitudes that they should ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, what then shall I do with Jesus whom you call the Christ. They all said to him, let him be crucified. Then the governor said, what evil has he done? But they cried out all the more saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could not prevail at all, but rather that the tumult was rising, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. You see to it. And all the people said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. They had a choice. 
they could have chosen Jesus to be released or they could have chosen anybody to be released but they chose the most the worst criminal in jail a murderer, a thief, a robber, an insurrectionist, the worst possible person, they say, let him go and crucify Jesus, kill Jesus. You see, even though the governmental authorities knew that Jesus was innocent, they really, really, really didn't want to crucify him. They didn't want to execute him. But you see, God's master plan was at work. God's plan was at work. And Jesus was destined to go to the cross. The purpose of his mission on this earth was to go to the cross. Amen? Even though he was perfectly innocent and perfectly good, and even though they hated him and they rejected him without a cause, and they chose out of their own free will, not knowing they were flowing in God's plan, to let Barabbas go free. You see, a lot of times people reject Jesus because they identify more with the, the riffraff. They identify more with the, the, the criminal, with the pervert, with, the, with the, the, the murderer, the robber. But the righteous man vexes their spirit and they seem to not be able to identify, especially religious people. The Bible says if the devil had known that he was playing into God's uh, master plan for our redemption and our salvation, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So even though these people were religious people and, and they thought they were operating of their own volition, their own free will, Man, they were operating in the divine plan and purpose of God. God knew that for Jesus to go to the cross, he was going to have to lay him in the charge of religious, dead, evil people. Amen? The worst hands you can fall in is a hand of a religious person who don't really know God. God knew that if I want him crucified so that the salvation of mankind could ensue, I got to place him in the hands of, uh, of somebody who's respectable and go to church. Who don't really know him. And they flow perfectly in the devil's plans. John, 1 Corinthians 2, 6, 8 says, this is the wisdom of God that we're talking about. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age who has come into nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Jesus came into this earth, saints, to die on the cross. He came into this earth to destroy the works of the devil. To destroy the works of the devil completely, he was going to have to go to the cross. Amen? The work of the cross was a perfect work. It was not flawed in any way. If you can understand what Jesus accomplished at the cross, check this out, all of your needs will be met. Every one of your needs will be met if you understand what Jesus accomplished at the cross. It's amazing how many people in this day and age in 2021 do not understand the purpose and the power that the cross carries. You'd be surprised. I've had people argue with me and tell me that, you know, if Jesus was smarter, he could have did this and did that and could have avoided the cross. I said, man, you don't even understand the plan of God. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, man, what, what if Barabbas had went to the cross for us? Amen. What if a thief and a robber had gone to the cross for us? We would yet be in our sins. Amen. We would yet be under the curse and all the other things that the devil has perpetrated on mankind because of the fall of Adam. In Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah, the prophet, looked by the power of the Holy Spirit into this incident that happened at the cross. And it was so marvelous. It was so awesome. 
because he would receive it by revelation of the Holy Ghost. And he didn't completely, I'm sure, understand what he was seeing. But he was obedient to the, the Spirit of God to articulate what the Spirit of God was showing him. And he said in Isaiah 53 verse 1 down through 8, he said, Who has believed our report? To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. He has no form or comeliness, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs. Surely he has borne our griefs means he has borne our sicknesses at the cross. He has borne our diseases at the cross and carried our sorrows. He carried our pains at the cross. So you don't have to carry grief any longer. You don't have to carry sickness and disease any longer. Because at the cross, the Bible says that Jesus Christ carried these things. Amen? It says, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was wounded for our rebellion. Rebellion is a condition that inflicts the whole of the human race. A spirit of rebellion against Legitimate authority, especially authority from God, is rejected by a whole mass of people. All of us were included at some time, and some of us still floored in that rebellion. But the Bible says that he was wounded to take away the devil's power to keep us in this rebellious condition. He was bruised for our iniquities. This is Jesus on the cross in the eyes of a natural person, another man being crucified. But in the eyes of God, the perfect Lamb of God that takes away the sin and the iniquities of the world, that takes away the diseases and the sickness and the grief of everyone who receives him on the cross. He was bruised for our iniquity. His iniquities is, it includes sin and mischievousness. Everybody knows what sin is. Sin, you miss the mark, man. You're just missing the mark. I mean, you just you know that you shouldn't be doing this and you, because it's violating God's will and perfect plan for your life, so you do it anyway. Mischievous is, is, is what you see oftentimes in churches. People just uh, iniquity, mischievous. Every time something going on, every time something happening, this this person is involved. You close your eyes. They, they tell you what happened. Who, who, who's oh that person involved? I know that person involved before they even mentioned their name. Mischievous. Yeah. Got to have their name and everything. Pastor said a thousand times, let's not do this. But the mischievous person is going to do it some kind of way, anyway, yeah. because they're mischievous. Iniquity is in it. When God launched this church, he launched this church with a word from 2 Timothy 2.19. And in that word it said, we will depart from iniquity. But you got to receive the word to depart from iniquity. Iniquity came with us. And it's still hanging on people. I'm not yelling at people. But every time I get up here, believe it or not, we have to deal with spirits. We have to deal with spirits. And one thing that I know is when I pray or speak to a spirit, that spirit has to bow down. That spirit got to go. It goes. My prayer is that the person who is carrying that spirit don't go with that spirit. That they let the spirit go so they can be who God wants them to be without that spirit controlling their lives. Amen? So sometimes when people leave, you know, you got to be careful how you invite them back. So you can come back with that devil hanging on you. You got to let that joker stay out. Amen. But you come on back in and let God bless you. Amen? 
But this mischievousness, Jesus said that he was wounded for our mis <laughs> how mischievous. He was beaten up. So why are we going to be mischievous and, and, and sinful if he didn't, got, he didn't took it all on himself? We don't have to be no more. Amen? The chastisement for our peace, our wholeness was upon him. And by his stripes, we are healed. Verse 6 says, we are all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the iniquities of, of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before the shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. He opened not his mouth. This is so important, saints, that he opened not his mouth. Because what happens when Jesus opens his mouth? When Jesus opens his mouth, all the angels of heaven are deployed. He doesn't speak idle words, amen? He doesn't speak, we should be the same way. The words that we speak should count. Every time we open our mouth, they should count for what we want to happen in our lives. Amen? We should so train our spirits until when we say something, our spirits that is connected to the Holy Ghost would cause heaven to move on our behalf to cause this thing to happen right now in our lives. Amen? Amen. So Jesus opened not his mouth because he didn't want to mess up the plan of salvation. He ain't one of them, he ain't one of them angels are waiting. The master, the Lord is, is, is there. And, and we, we, all you got to do is just say one word. Say one word and they would have messed up the whole plan of salvation. So he opened not his mouth. He was silent. Amen. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And the question is, who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living for the transgression of my people. He was stricken. He was stricken for us, saints. He was beaten for us. Everything was laid on him. And as a result of it being laid on him, we have been freed up now so that we can experience the full benefit of the salvation package that God has given us when we receive Jesus Christ. Amen? See, at the cross, the great exchange happened. The great exchange. Exchange. God took our sin for nature. He took all the stuff the devil had placed on us. And he gave us his righteousness. He made us righteous when we receive this Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. During this transaction at the cross, the evil that was in us was put on him so the good that was on him could come in us. He was punished so that we might be forgiven. He was made sick so that we could be healed. He endured poverty so that we could have his riches. He endured rejection so that we might have his acceptance. He suffered death so that we could experience his life. Amen? And this next point is so important. All of them are important, but get this one. And you about to get your victory. You about to get your victory over every situation or circumstance that the devil tried to ever perpetrate you with. Amen? He, if you get this one, you're going to make every diagnosis of every doctor seem like it didn't apply to you at all. Amen? You're going to see breakthroughs in the area of finances that you never dreamt would come into your life. It would be like a dream that one day you hear and you dreaming and seeing other people and now all of a sudden you hear and you open up to receive all that God has given you in this transaction that he executed on the cross in Jesus. He took away the curse. What? What are you talking about, Pastor? He took away the curse. Galatians 3, 13, 14, put it up, Matthew, says this. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, has become a curse for us. For it is written, 
Cursed is everyone who hangs on the tree that the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles in Christ Jesus that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. He took away the curse, saints, so that we might receive the blessing. We might receive the blessing. Amen? I don't know about you, but I don't like the curse. The curse is an empowerment for everything that could go wrong to go wrong in your life. Amen? It is poverty, all kind of sickness, and spiritual deaths, which is separation from God in every aspect of your life. I don't like the curse. Amen? But the blessing, on the other hand, saints, is the very blessing that God gave to Abraham that we received in Jesus Christ. It's an empowerment to prosper in every area of your life, in your body, in your soul, in your spirit, in every arena of your life. The blessing has the power to affect and to change for the good. Amen. If you're a student of the Bible, you want to read the, 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 the real details of the curse, you can go to, I'm not going to go there now, but Deuteronomy 27, 28 talks about some of the things that's included in the curse. But I'm going to let you know a few things now that are, that are indicators. That are indicators that you can probably identify and deal with right now that will free you up and open the floodgate of blessings to come into your life like you've never experienced ever before. You see, curses, the Bible says, is, is kind of like blessings in the sense that they last for thousands of generations. And so there, there, there are people who walk around saved, sanctified, washed in the blood of Jesus, spirit-filled, speaking in the tongues and everything else who are living situation and circumstances that are unfavorable to them that came as a result of somebody hundreds of even thousands of years ago in your bloodline doing something that somehow was not severed and broken before it got to you. What? I'm talking spiritual stuff now, saints, amen? If you go to the doctor in the hospital, they don't understand this. Uh, they, they don't understand. This. Doctors, I appreciate doctors and stuff. Praise God. Hallelujah. I, I love doctors, man, because they, 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 I was talking to them a lot the last two months and stuff. And some of them thought I was crazy because I would say, let me, let me talk to you. I know what you're saying here, but let me talk to you about, about, about what the situation is and what's going to happen. They say, well, okay, go on. I said, well, you know, God's hand is on your life. The wisdom of God is going to come on you. And the wisdom of God is going to guide you and direct you in such a skillful, miraculous way until you're going to have to stand back and wonder what has come over you. Because you're going to do the best that you've ever done because you're dealing with one of God's kids. Saints, we are blessed of God. And like that song that Sister Cunning was singing to, your faith is demonstrated by what you say. A lot of people say, Pastor, I got it. I understand. But you don't say nothing. And so you're not demonstrating anything, so nothing happens. Your faith is demonstrated by what you speak. Amen? There are indications, and if you have several of these things working in your life, Pay attention, it's not an accusation. You only know yourself. And God knows you. The pastor don't know you. I get accused oftentimes by people thinking that somebody told me their business. They kind of told me nothing about you. I'm not preaching to you. I'm preaching what God says to say, amen? But if you have several of these things working in your bloodline, I'm here to say this because you have the authority and the power to break that stuff right now today in Jesus' name, amen? I don't know if you want to break it. You can break it. If you don't want to break it, let it keep on flowing and say, oh, it's a scientific reason. How do you know? I, just let, I trust the science. If you trust the science, I'm tired of hearing I trust the science. If they trust the science, why do a man who got a part that fits perfectly into a woman who got a part, all of a sudden, the science don't work for that. 
Now all of a sudden the science say a man and a man and a woman and a woman be together. Because they changed the science to fit their narrative. I trust the word, amen? amen. Only trust the word. If you have in your family, in your bloodline, a situations of mental or emotional breakdown, if you have situations or a history of chronic diseases, if you have situations or circumstances of sexual perversion, including homosexuality in your family, your bloodline, if you have a history or occasions of miscarriages, if you have a situation or a history of marital or family breakdowns, divorces, if you have a situation, a history of financial insufficiency, always not enough. Mama didn't have enough, grandmama didn't have enough, I ain't got enough. If you have a history, a situation in your family or your bloodline of being accident prone, always have an accident. If you have a history in your family, in your bloodline of suicide. Somebody that you know in your bloodline and someone else in your bloodline commit suicide. If you have several of these working, don't be scared. But the curse is still trying to hang on. Still trying to hang on in your bloodline. But I have news for you today. At the cross, God gave us the key to break it. He gave us the key to break whatever that curse is, whatever that manifestation is, whether it's cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, whether it's just welfare, whether it's just evil and perverted thoughts. He has given us the key. And that key is shaped just like the cross. And it will break and sever the curse and every manifestation of that curse that the devil is trying to perpetrate on you. Amen? So we're going to pray before we leave. And we're going to break whatever is hanging on. If you want to break it, you can walk out of here today with, his, with it broken. Amen? You might not understand it, but you don't have to understand what God says and what God does. If God says it and we believe it, then God does it. Amen? Amen? You see, those people in that passage that we led, read earlier, they chose Barabbas. They chose Barabbas on purpose. They knew what kind of character he was. But today, God has given us another opportunity, another chance. See, when you choose Jesus, God chooses you. And when you choose Jesus, the same power that raised him from the dead raises you up from whatever situation or circumstance life has placed you in. It will raise you up from everything evil that the enemy wants to put on you. And it will raise you and keep you away from anything that devil wants to keep on you. You see, the children of Israel came out of slavery by the will of God and on Moses' faith. But when God brought them to the threshold of the promised land, they were required to believe God for themselves and to use their own faith to enter into the promised land. You see, God's will today is for everyone to be saved. To everyone to come into the knowledge of the truth, for everyone to be free of everything that the curse has perpetrated on mankind because of the fall of Adam. But most of us got here to this point on someone else's faith, someone else's prayers of faith, our parents, our children, our grandchildren, our grandparents' faith, or some anonymous praying spirit-filled saints praying for God to save us, to get us to this point on their faith. 
But saints, God is calling us to step up now on what he's taught us. He wants to step up now and use what he has equipped us with and not be like the children of Israel who forfeited their right to go to the promised land because they would mix what God has given them with faith. They wouldn't put it in their mouth and begin to talk it and walk it. God wants us to begin to put this in, in the mixer, begin to talk it and walk it and experience the glory that comes from going into our wealthy place in him, free from all the curses and evils in this life and into that blessed place where all of our needs are met by God. Amen? So saying, check this out. Every time that you hear the word of God being taught or preached, you are required to answer the same question in order to continue to move further into the beauty and blessing of the salvation experience. You see, this story about Jesus and Barabbas is not a, just a historical account of what happened. It's a situation that we are presented with every time we hear the word of God. Every time we hear it proclaimed and preached. I know people come in, they come in, they, they don't want to just do anything but listen and go ahead and come out in the same way all the time but time is out for that we're in the last of the last days saints this pandemic was a dry run for the rapture the next time could be Jesus coming back to snatch away his church when this pandemic hit there was a question asked who will you choose Jesus or Barabbas Today, with this message, God is asking the same question. Who do you choose? Jesus of a rabbis. If you choose Jesus, you choose life. The prices have been already paid. The punishments have already been done to him. The victory has already been won. It's time now, saints, for the saints of God to rise up and to receive every blessing that God has allotted for each one of us to receive. And you have to receive it by faith. It means you hear the word, you accept the word, and you begin to walk in that word to the best of your ability. And as you begin to do those things, then God will meet you, and then he will carry you forward into the wealthy place of your purpose and your destiny that you were born into this world to experience. Amen? So I thank God for this day. I thank God for the saints of God who are here. I thank God for the saints of God who are not here. Amen? I thank God for those who receive the word. I thank God for those who don't receive the word. I thank God for Jesus. I thank God that he paid the price for us. That we don't have to suffer no more with all the stuff that the devil tried to put on us. That no matter what happens to us, we have an escape route. That escape route is choosing Jesus. Jesus, we choose you. We choose your blood. We choose your stripes. We choose your healing. We choose your prosperity. We choose your victory. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Now say this after me, saying, Say, Heavenly Father, I thank you that Jesus Christ came in the flesh and died in my place and he broke the curse of the law from off of my life that I'm free from this day forward by the blood of Jesus from every mental and emotional breakdown from every chronic sickness from every sexual perverted thought and act from every miscarriage, from every breakdown in families, from every financial insufficiency, from every accident, from every suicidal thought. Father, I thank you that I'm free by the blood of Jesus from the curse. And I'm free to receive entry into my wealthy place. Father, you said it. I really receive it, so be it. Amen, saints. Come in. Glory to God. Glory to God.